Hey, hey, for for all the crap that we've stolen from all the other languages, you can't expect anyone to know all the proper grammar. Brought to you by some guys on the internet. This is getting tabled. With your hosts, Jason the Bruce. You guy! George the Yang. I hope you're all entertained by my inaptitude. Jason, a.k.a. Major Socks. We've been doing this and talking about various stuff. One of the stuff. Now sit back, relax, and get tabled. Hello, future people, and welcome to episode 86 of Getting Tabled with your host, The Bruce. Hello, folks. Back again. Back into it. And we have ourselves a major problem. Well, it's not that major. I mean, he's here, and, and a it's a major. bit of a problem. Uh, and that's Major Socks. Hello, everyone. It's good to have everyone back again. Welcome back to the show. Uh, we got a lot to talk about tonight. And above me is George the Yank, who's somewhat doing okay in, in Wyoming right now. The land of nowhere. A man of good grammar, so he says. I'm putting the lotion on my skin so I don't get the hose again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before I get into the news, George, are you happy? Um, that's such an existential question. Um, am, what is happiness? Is it like being able to sleep a full night or having food or getting a thing that has 50 bajillion dots on it that people are going to give you sh crap about for uh, paint, not painting. Well, the, yeah. well uh, Dave, Dave said it was okay. Although, although Dave did say that he's not okay. going to do it either. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into the news Thanks, and we'll discuss Dave. this. Newly received or noteworthy information, especially about recent or important events. All right, and so, on the screen now we have our finally, yeah. This thing is massive. Um, um, one of the comments calls it the Shaltari Pede, and it's like, oh yeah, I can see that. Like based that off the, the human centipede movie. <laughs> yeah, it's either that or it's the ant that wears its own its own heads on top of its head to create like a giant hat. Yeah, it sheds exactly. its head. So, I, I, I'm kind of got mixed uh, feelings about this model. Well, well, finally, yes, the Shaltari have their behemoth. Um, pardon the, uh, the dog. He's being a needy jerk. Um, there is a whole lot of legs going on that. Yep. Yeah. And then, oh. like, if this was in April, I would have been like, Dave, are you kind of messing with us here? Because the structure of this thing looks really weird. Well, a lot of Shaltari stuff looks really weird. Well, I, I understand uh, that. But... I think this one takes the cake, though. Yeah, I mean... It... <laughs> I'm curious I mean, to know how much of this is going to be posable. I don't think you're going to be able to pose it too well, because if you pose it the wrong way, it's going to tip. Yeah, it, it looks like yeah, it's going to be agree. very top-heavy with that uh, triad on top. Um, yeah. Which... Uh, What's the Shaltari saying about triads? Like, are they like feng shui or something? Yeah, they they like them a lot because it's got something to do with the sharpness of, of the of their spines. Um, but this is pretty cool. Actually, look at this. This actually doesn't have too many dots. No, they're all, they're all on the inside. I can see quite a few of them. Well, well yeah. I... The, the... Yeah, the but comparing this to it... even like a heavy battle cruiser, you know. Yeah. This is not that many dots. Well, you have no excuse then. You have to paint them all. No, Dave said I don't have to because he's not going no, to. No, but you said there's, no, there's enough of them. No, nope. don't have to. No, nope. nope. Dave said. <laughs> Dave, Dave also said sense, that. You, that's... Dave also said, no, George, you got to paint them all. Um, he was, yeah. For those that don't know, well, you should join the Patreon. There's a video. <laughs> um, or go yeah. and watch. TT Combat's Twitch channel, where Dave was on it. You've probably got a few more days before it'll disappear at this point. Your stuff on Twitch only stays there as a backlog for a certain amount of time. Um, I, I like this. It's very, very different. 
Um, the only thing. The I, other ones. Well, yeah. I, it, the only thing I don't like is the fact that we only have the one angled shot, and I kind of want to know if it's hollow on the inside or not. And you can't really tell from this angle. I think the fact that it looks hollow might be a little bit of an optical illusion, just because of the angle that we're on. I'd like to get some more shots of it. But I doubt we'll get any more until next week. This isn't even on the previous site yet. This is only on their Facebook. Yeah, oh, actually, so, hang on. There's a video. It might be on the video. Yeah. Uh, what I don't like about show it... Much on the video. Yeah. What I don't like about it is, if you look at the, the Scourge, you know, it's tentacles. That's awesome, because Scourge. You look at the PHR and the UCM. These are gigantic, huge mechs with gigantic, huge legs. This one... These look like the same legs from all the other giant, bit large walkers, and it's just got like what? Uh, there's four, seven, eight, nine. So we'll call it eighteen to twenty legs. I I, I don't know about that. I, I I think the Shaltari have you know enough anti grav technology, enough you know whatever else that it could have been a different design. I mean, this is the direction Dave wanted to go. Um, it does look Shaltari, so you, you can't fault him there, at least. Um, I, I'm really curious to see what that big gun on top is, because usually by the time you get to something, you know, really big and heavy duty for the Shaltari, the weapon is ridiculous. True. Yeah. My guess is that the anti-behemoth uh, weapon. Um, An anti-behemoth behemoth? Yeah, exactly. Well, Say that five times now. Fox. There was one that we didn't know that there was one of those coming. Yes. Um, it was teased rather early on that one of them would be anti behemoth. Or at least that they would have a build out that was anti behemoth. I also suspect that there will be more than just the one gun because, of course, there will be. Um, looking yeah. at the video, I think at least part of that centerpiece is hollow. Um, I'm kind of hoping it's not. Because if it's hollow, that's, I don't know, I would rather there be at least something in between those two. Otherwise, it's just going to look like a giant CD stacker. And one of the Scourge well, things already look like a CD stacker. I was going to say, yeah, the, the Scourge already have the lockdown on that, so. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, it'll be interesting to yeah. see. Obviously, when this goes live on the website, we'll get more pictures. Um, But I wanted to talk about this because, well, we've been waiting to see it. And like to be fair... I don't know why this one took so long. I, I guess it took so long just because, well, they didn't... You've got five million pieces to put together and half of those are the legs, as George mentioned. I don't have a problem pieces. with the legs, honestly. The fact that it has so many legs might help if there's posability in it to keep it more stable. Yeah. Um, but Because obviously the base, where the legs are, is wider than the rest of it so that it doesn't tip. But I don't know. I don't have a problem with that. I can see what George is saying. I just don't have that problem personally. I, I will I say these legs are a lot bigger than the ones that the Jaguar and the other War Striders have. In terms yeah, of I don't know. They, if you look at that tank, they look about the same size. So that's the Cayman tank, and the Cayman tank is about four inches long. Okay, so, look, look, at the, look at the troops there to the, to the right. Correct. So... They, you could be right. They may be the same size as the Warstrider. Right? I have to look at my Sheltari and kind of look at them at a scale. Yeah. Uh, but we can uh, definitely tell that this thing's going to be over six inches tall because that middle square building in the back is a six-inch building. And, and it towers uh, it, yeah. The, and it towers over it just by the angle that we're looking at it. So this thing's probably going to be six, seven and a half inches tall, depending on how you pose it. Yeah. All right. Moving on. I am on record a couple of episodes ago saying that I would love to see more people doing towers that just look like terrain. Well, guess what Sarissa Precision are doing? Tower, nice towers that look like terrain. Literally. They've got one here that looks like an Multiple. ancient castle. They've got one here that looks like it's out of World War II. They've got another one that looks like it's one of the mega city blocks from Judge Dredd. And we've got another one that's perfect for Bushido. Uh, I assume that there will be more of these. Uh, this is a Kickstarter that they have coming up shortly. This is all pre-coloured. Um, I mean, the last pre-coloured one that I looked at very closely ended up being very disappointing, but that's another story. Thanks, Justin. But the fact that 
the fact that someone is jumping into the market of making Dice Tower terrain, yeah. I, I think that's huge, just because that's that's one of the biggest problems with playing a game is where do you roll your dice? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I and mean, look, don't, like we do know that there are other people that have done this. This is why I've discussed this in the past. Um, I mean, TT Combat have one for Drop Zone, for example. Um, they've also got one in their Wild West range. Um, the Grain Silo turns into a dice tower. There's a Frostpunk game. Yes. Yeah, the board mm-hmm. game. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> um, I like the look of this. I mean, we, we've only got these images at this stage. Um, apparently, well, this has been coming for a while because they're talking down the bottom here about in 2019 about what happened and stuff. Um, so this has been planned for a while and it's been put off, obviously. So it'll be, I, I suspect that we'll get some unlocks, uh, for stretch goals and so forth. It'll give us some more designs. I wouldn't mind seeing something that's a little bit more, dare I say, grim dark. Um, I mean, the judge Sigmar. Dream, sort of, but well, I was the, the trying to use generic one. terms. Yeah. I, um, I was going to say the, uh, um, the, the judge dread one, uh, that looks like it'd be good for like an infinity type game too, you know, just, yeah, the, so, um, yeah, I would, I would love to see this, uh, uh, have at least four unlocks where you get four other styles. Yeah. Um, I don't I honestly don't know why uh, more companies haven't jumped on this, you know, dice tower as terrain uh, idea. I don't know. I mean, it, it's probably a little harder to design than we think it is, maybe. Um, but at the same time, because the the problem is, is that they're all ultimately end up going to look the same. You just take going to have a little bit of decoration, and you got to find a reason to have the yard in front of the building. Um. That that would be my thought, is that it maybe it's just not as easy as we think it would be. But it seems like like you just take a building, cut a hole out of the front of it, and you have a yard in front of it. And obviously you've got to have the internal structure so that the dice get knocked around and come out randomly. Have have you not seen the mausoleum terrain from, you know, fantasy where you literally have a graveyard and a building? Yeah. I mean But if you I mean, I mean I'm just trying to guess as to why more people haven't done this. I mean, to me, it seems yeah. like easy money. Uh, because as much as everybody has terrain, this is an idea that most people won't have. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It just, that, that's my thoughts on the matter. Moving on. There's this little company called Games Workshop that we occasionally talk about. Uh, and they're doing more of this. We're giving out rules thing which again for those that don't know how rare this is i know we're talking about it two episodes in a row hey, this is hey, insanely Bruce. rare this doesn't happen this is why they're charging more probably hey we'll charge more for everything but we'll give the rules away no they're, they're doing this as, <laughs> this particular one in particular is um oh i just realized it was the next one that was the free rule oh no i didn't put it on there okay i'm going to talk about it anyway uh, they're giving away some very simple basic rules for their kill team. Uh, it's not the full thing like they did last episode. Um, I just realized that this is not the article that I thought it was because <laughs> I decided that it wasn't really that exciting. But still, like, it, I'm giving credit where it's due because Games Workshop are a company that don't do anything for the consumer and they have openly been doing that of late so i'm giving credit where it's due uh and when i say like they don't do anything for the consumer none of their deals <laughs> like nothing like none of their bundle deals not like nothing is done for the consumer i mean it's business so that's that's fine um but there seems to be at least for these five minutes a conscious effort to actually do more but okay kill team they're doing an annual so I have mixed feelings about this personally. Um, so this annual is like an annual an annual refresh that's going to come alongside a new big box because, of course, there's a new big box. Um, I'm starting to get as negative and, sh- and everything on these big boxes as a lot of creators are at this stage. Um, 
there is some really nice models that are being teased alongside this. But basically what this article is talking about is how we're going to get an annual refresh every year now, um, which the reason that I feel negative on this is because it basically is turning Kill Team into Warhammer and Age of Sigma. And one of the things that I liked about Kill Team uh, is that it wasn't that, and it was like it was just a skirmish game. Like, whereas they're clearly trying to turn this into something that you have to continue buying for now as well. Um, it'll it's too early to tell. It's just, just maybe that is just me being a little bit too salty. Um, but Games Workshop do this all the time with everything, so I don't know why I'm surprised either. An annual is not necessarily a bad thing because obviously it's also a chance for them to balance. And the reason I'm doing this when I say balance is Games Workshop don't know how to do that. Uh, I'm sorry, they don't. Uh, they never have. Well, the, the problem is with balance is because, you know, they only do like two things at a time. Well, it's not, it's not so much done, just that. Games Workshop, the, like as much as I'm throwing shade, uh, Games Workshop don't actually try to do anything balanced either. They're more interested in the game, the game being fun than they are the game being competitive. They're, like they don't actually aim to make competitive games. It's just that because they're so popular, that's what the player base wants. So that's why quite what? frequently you get things that are so outbalanced and so broken because that's that was never their aim to begin with, and they've never pretended that that was their aim either. Just for the record. Well, and and the problem is too is you know they start with a couple and they do a couple of time and by the time they get through the range, the stuff that they did at the beginning has just been trounced over by everything else they've done because they didn't do it all at the same time. That's yeah. what you have to do. That's why you know Privateer Press, uh, Infinity, uh, Bushido, TT Combat, Bushido, like all those games where they do everything all at once, everything's play tested all at once. Guess what? It tends to be more balanced. I can talk about, like, Bushido, what Jason Enos appears to have done. Um, now, we don't know this for a fact, because I don't know for a fact whether he's actually said that he's done this or not, but I'm pretty sure he has, because there's been enough talk in the community about this, is that he went through all of the abilities that everybody has and has actually worked out exactly what those abilities cost. Um, now, we don't know what those factors are, but it means that every time they release a new thing, they already know what it needs to cost for it to be fair because they yeah. worked all of that out to begin with. That is an extremely rare thing in this industry. Yeah. And as someone that's currently working on a secret project, I'm starting to appreciate that a real lot. <laughs> yeah, that's something we're, we're seeing in the Star Wars Legion community. Uh, everyone that's a Galactic Republic player feels like they just got nerfed and is – and Right now, in the tournament settings... That How often do they do their... Because they, re they do an annual refresh as well, don't they? They actually almost do it biannually. Um, bi they'll, they'll put out... Okay. So, oh, well, wait. twice a year. No, twice a year. They'll, they'll do okay, yeah. Points. So, yeah, that is, that is gross, yeah. Uh, points updates and stuff like that. And so... Because um, the, we're expecting to see one here in the next month or two. Um, okay. On some, some stuff. Biannual so. is... That I would argue that that's problematic. Yeah. All right, moving on. Um, to a little company called Games Workshop. <laughs> um, Another one. I need to get a new joke. I've been using that one for six months now. Um. Okay. So we have a new figure coming out for Necromunda, which is another one of these games that now also gets regular stuff. Uh. But this one is. A sky cycle and i really like these models i would um, say these are probably arguably some of the best models i've seen in the industry it definitely reminds me of orc stuff and i suspect that that's not accidental given that we're talking about necromunda mm -hmm. uh, it also kind of, i mean this is very clearly going to be something that you can only build one way but i suspect that there's going to be more to these kits. Like th these ones that they're showing off show different hairstyles, and that's it. I, different weapons. 
different weapons different on the sides weapons? too. Oh, there is. Yeah, yep. It it's very. It was hard to see at first, but yeah, you feel it closely. It's yeah, different weapons. But even just painting them different colors has already made each of these look a lot different than they really are. Um, this is a kit that I think you could do a lot with and have a lot of fun with. Um, I, I, it, I would, it seems that we're getting vehicles for every faction now. Yeah, I, I would use these as like some other like you know sky bike or hover bike or whatever for forty k. Like that's how good these look. Like the, the, these look like orc bikes, and I don't think that's accidental. Mm. I think they've been designed to look that way on purpose, because Necromunda is backwater. Nobody cares about it. So what do they do? They're throwing things together, which is what orcs do. That's just my thought. I'm going to go look at some orcs right now. But keep talking. <laughs> Specifically, speed freaks is <coughs> where my thought came from. They don't really have flying vehicles. Well, sorry, they don't have they flying have- bikes, but that's what this reminds me of, is orc technology. I'm not saying that they have stolen orc bikes. I'm saying that they have that feel because that's how they would be built in-world. By throwing things they, together, they, they they look more they look very orcish, but they look more put together than orc. That's like fair. The, like t- to me, these look more like what the uh, the Vespa squad should have been riding in uh, Boba Fett. Anybody else notice the leopard print type designs on the back of their fins? Yeah, I did. Uh, is that, is that yeah. they're uh, uh, sponsored by uh, uh, Joe Passage? Sure. Am I supposed to know who that is? Tiger King? Uh, that's why I don't know. Who went to high school in Laramie, Wyoming? Not an exaggeration, he did. Y- you poor thing. Are you okay? I don't know. H- how did you survive I mean, living I'm... near that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, I-, I really like this. I actually do show the artwork that's inspired it as well. Um, th- they've kind of exaggerated it and kind of made it look a little bit more broken down than the actual artwork itself because the like the intake in the original artwork looks like it comes from an actual jet whereas the one that's on the model obviously looks like it comes from something from world war one mm-hmm. um i i really really like this i'm it makes like me said, curious I- to see what everybody else is going to get now because if everybody's getting vehicles don't know what you do for the Delac, unless they end up with those ugly-looking limousine things that they've done for um, <clears throat> um, the Gene Steeler cults. Yeah, you know, like I said, I I would say this is probably one of the, the the best-looking you know bike minis in in the industry period. I really like it. I wouldn't go that far because the ones that I've been purchasing lately, I do think look nicer, but it's a much different aesthetic. The- the Affinity ones, don't, they look good too, but... I, For different reasons. Yeah. The things I like about vehicles like this is they kind of only work in this setting. Like in any other game, you would just look at it and go, well, that's just a 40k thing. But that you yeah. don't, that it, it doesn't work in any other setting, which should sound odd what? and should be a bad thing, but it's not. It, it helps the world what? feel more itself. Let's be honest. Look at those, you know, in any any setting, period. They just, they shouldn't work, period. Because, mm. well, it's a giant jet engine. Your city of stride, a jet engine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and last on the Games Workshop front, we are looking back at the Leagues of Voltan. Uh, because, and I'm going to thank George for this story, because I didn't even see it. Um, this guy is really cool. It's like so, it's the, like a squat met up with um with Khan the, and the, the and, they de- and they decided to have a child and this is the result. Actually, I'm going to say it looks more like the uh, Primaris Captain. Yeah, I could see with that the, as well. It, it, it's oh, it's almost virtually the same armor except for well, it's a short squat uh, uh, armored guy. And and let's be honest, you know, power armor is power armor. Yeah, you can't make so. too many differences in power armor. But this has, you know, the dwarven influence in the belt. He's got a little thingy coming off his, his backpack with the dragon head. You know, he's got the, the other symbology across the armor. They're doing what they can to make it, you know, not a space marine. It's still power armor. 
and it's a multi part kit, which is scarily yeah. rare for them now. Um, like well, the I, amount of I, stuff that they're doing now that's just monopose and stuff. Although this doesn't say that it'll be mu- that it'll be multi pose, so it may not be. I better I better not get my hopes up on that. Um, my, my, I'll say my, this: at it. it reminds me of Jekka Takan a little bit too. Yeah, look at this. It looks like a different head, different arms, and that's about it. Yeah. Because if you look at the tactical rock and the boots, they're the same. They're the exact same. True. But you wouldn't bother with all of, yeah. I mean, that that would be fine for me. Um, and they've made it look like, I think that this is monopose. It's just that those pieces come off in different ways. But yeah. I, think that's, I don't think that's a flat socket. I think that is... I think that is very much something that's only designed to go one way, but they've just designed now, it in a way to make it look like you can pose it. Um, now, I, I know your one complaint about the, the, the Leagues of Oton, Bruce, has been the heads, and both the heads for this kit I think are stunning. It's not that I've had a problem with the heads. It's that it's felt like they've only been using five or six different ones and that right, they all well, kind a- of felt the same. Um, these definitely, I mean, the other head is actually a helmet, um, ironically. Well, it, it's a very dwarf helmet because, you yes. know, mm-hmm. it's a, because it's literally know. a dwarf. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I saw this like the, the, within like five minutes of them posting this, I saw it and I was just like, Ooh, that looks so good. Yeah. No, that, that, this is, might be the best thing they've shown off so far, I think. Um, and you'd want to hope so because it's clearly one of the heroes. Um, Correct. Yeah, it's it's going to be your general. It better look good. Yeah, I just saw what they're calling it. It's a battle ready Chthonian berserks. So we can't call it corn, but we have to make it sound like it's corn. Well, it's, it's the League of Votan call. Um, just after the the Votan logo. Even the most level-headed Hearthkin warriors and battle-ready Chthonian berserks need a stern voice. Oh, okay. Never mind. I can see what you mean. That's the things that take orders from this guy. Yeah. yeah. So, I, like I said, um, I really like this. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 yet I, I'd like to see them do a post here in a couple months, you know, because, you know, it's coming up. But I'd like to see them do, like, you know, everything that's, you know, for the line. You know, like, ready to go kind of thing. Well, if our predictions are on, and they are just predictions, we don't know anything. But yeah, we said November been, this year, so. We be, yeah, we said November because that's when <laughs> the last two were around. The Elf one and the Sisters of Battle one. Um, so that would have to be that have to be doing that post during October at some point. Um, because there won't be enough time for everybody to complain about how they can't buy it otherwise. Right. <laughs> um, and that is me throwing shade at the community, not a games workshop, just for the record. Um, the artwork on this guy, he looks really tall in that artwork. Uh, what, one of the other things was, you know, because he's on the tactical rocks and with that artwork... But they, he's got they, two um, tactical rocks, so he's even better. Well, yeah. one, of, one of them, there are his grudge rocks. <laughs> <laughs> yep, no, that's fair. Yep, no, that's fair. All right, moving so, on from moving Halflings. on. Sorry, moving on from d- space dwarves. Little people? Yes, to space halflings. Um, there Which was a time cool, the where there was like some significant people out there screaming for halfling minis um they, because nobody was really doing them all over them. oh they're everywhere now i mean tt combat yeah. just did a whole kickstarter full of them this ironically i feel would fit in with the tt combat stuff really nicely though we haven't seen them side by side for obvious reasons they're different companies um well I if you get the sql really files you could scale them so true uh, I have opinions on the STL files, but we'll come back to that later. Um, I really like these look gorgeous. So this is by Victorian Minis or Victorian Miniatures. And it says Victoria Lamb. That's the sculptor, not the company. Uh, she is like one of the significant owners and stuff. Victoria Miniatures have been around for 
ages. Like, they are a staple of the community. Um, and I think that they've done really well here, honestly. Like, that it's a multiple part kit. Probably the only one that I don't like is the Bamboo Bull Roar guy, just because he looks so weird. But that's fine, because I don't have to like everything. Um, yes, you do. It's required, Bruce. Mm -hmm. Fine. I suppose I will like it. No, it's just it's just one of those things. That particular mini doesn't do anything for me. Uh, but everything appears to be poseable. Even the sword coming on that guy has a ball in it, so you can kind of change the angle of how he's holding the the chain sword. Uh, you've got bare normal heads. Uh, you've got bare female heads. Normal's the wrong word. But you've got you've got a standard male head, a standard female head, and then you've got gas masks as well. Which I think is awesome. <laughs> yes. like th These could fit anywhere, pretty much. Um, the ten female heads, now all of them look really nice, too, and very calorectiful. They're kind of, like, they're cartoony enough to feel fun, yeah. but without not feeling like they would fit. Um, Isn't that the point of halflings, though? That was kind of what I was going on with, yes. Yeah. But here's the thing, and I, I know I said this in our private conversation as well. So you can get a set of these for $39. They're plastic. Uh, Going to be CO cast from memory? Yeah. Yeah, CO cast, uh, which is priced really well. So why on earth would I pay $29 for a set of STLs on this? But th that STL option to me Looks like it's been priced deliberately so that people have the option but won't bother. That's what it feels like to me because twenty nine dollars for us for the STL squad. That's I feel like that's too much. Personally, I know Michelle disagreed with me on that. Um, but I just I don't think that STL is worth it. Um, for a ten dollar difference, and this is US dollars we're talking about. Um, so for me, it's $41 versus 56. Well, so the, if, if you're doing one squad, yeah, do the plastic one. If you're going to do like five squads, you pay the SCL, then you just, you know, you're using your materials. Yeah, but that, that's, that's my argument. Lot, that's a lot more expensive than what most companies would charge for a squad of this size for STL files. This is my point. $29, $29 for a 10-man squad, 11 I, if you include the stretch goals, is nowhere near $30 in value. I, I don't disagree, but again, you know... I mean, it's their business. They can set their own prices. Yeah, you know, if they could, you know, say you can only, you know, you can only use the STL files once and you have to buy the STL files. Yeah, I could... So the, my argument is, you know, with with the STL file is you've bought that, you have the rights to it for your personal use. Mm. You could sit there and you know just crank them out. Yeah, yeah. but so but you can so do that, that with a set my, that you buy for ten or fifteen dollars as well. This is my well, point. The what they're charging right. is significantly higher than what the industry normally would. Right, so you buy the pack of models for the fifty bucks or whatever. You have that one pocket pack of models. You have to spend another fifty bucks. You spend the the slightly less price for the SCLs, and they could do six squats. Okay. They're 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 I they're they're intentionally charging more for the STLs to get their money's worth out of selling the STLs. Yeah. So this this is, is what I'm the, my point is, and, and I don't know this. This is just the impression I have. Because the price on the STL is expensive, and it's way more expensive than it should be. But because they've done it, they don't have to listen to people arguing over the fact that they want digital copies. They now have their option. Uh, and yeah. it's been priced at a point where, honestly, I think most people will go the other way because there's better value the other way. Uh, I know that you can print multiple copies of an STL file. That is how they work. But... $39 for a set of 11 miniatures is stupidly expensive compared to what the rest of the industry is doing. I oh, like that that is that is that is my hill that I will die on. It's too expensive for the STL files. 
I love well, these minis, though. Yeah, and my argument is just, you know, they're getting more value out of selling their files that way, I think, is why they're yeah. doing it. So, because if they, if they sell the files at 50% 50 that price, which is more the industry standard, that, you know, they're not going to get as much out of the work. Yes, because, yeah. So. Yeah. All right, moving on. Um, so I feel like I'm hitting my head against a brick wall. All right. I put this on here for you, Sox. So you better appreciate it. No, I do appreciate it. It's Victory at Sea. So, and it's, I've been looking forward to these models coming out. Um, so the first one we're looking at is the HMS Wall of Pindy, which is a CT. Yeah. So it was a cargo liner that was turned into an auxiliary warship. So think of it as a armored uh, troop transport in a sense. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I don't play the British, so I probably won't get this one. Uh, but it, it is a cool concept to have on the board. Yeah. Um, so. And hey, look at this. One. They're actually showing us multiple angles. Oh, yeah. That's helpful to look at the mini. I'm sorry, yep. Louie. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I realize that you're only sharing one image at this stage for a reason and that we will get more later. I'm just making a joke. All right, moving on. So the next one is the Benson class destroyer. Uh, I will probably be getting a set of these since I play US. Um, so it's good to see more destroyers coming out. Um, the the US also have new planes. So if you scroll down, you can actually see the new planes, the Dauntless and the Devastator flights. I've been dying for them to come out with those flights um, because they had primarily fighters. And it's about time they get more dive bombers and torpedo bombers for the game for the U.S. because they needed them. So I can actually fill the, a carrier fleet. Um, but, yeah, I'll be getting some of these probably three to start out with, maybe six in the end, um, just depending on how I go. Yep. And, and, and the then last the next, one uh, is the J-Class. Yep. So a – who was this one for? I want to say it's – Yep, this is another British class uh, destroyer. Um, so, again, probably won't be getting these ones, uh, but for those that play the Royal Navy, uh, great little ship um, to have because it's always good to have more just smaller support ships. In the I game. actually really like the, the Benson class, is probably my favorite, honestly, uh, out of the ones that we've looked at. But I do yeah. think all three of them look where you're in it very nice. Yeah, and, and but I mean the J class is clearly named after me. I mean there wouldn't be a J there otherwise. So, I, I we, we have to like it. You're going to have to buy them socks because uh, they named it after okay. you. You have to buy them. Yeah, that's true. Because his name's not Jason. Sorry, it's major, major. Song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I'm called the Bruce for no reason at all. No reason at all. No, I just decided I was going to be called that one day. No, I decide you're going to be called that one day. <laughs> yeah, because his name is Jackson. All right. And that, that started out from the hot LZ days. Yeah, quite Long literally. We're, we're actually referring to a conversation that's four years ago at this point. If five. Not longer. Five? Oh, no, because we've been yeah, going three years here. Yeah, no, it'd have to be five. All right, moving on. Anyways. No, I, I think Warlord have done some really nice stuff there. Uh, it's yeah, it's they, not it's a game got... for me. Uh, and that's fine, um, but but they did some really nice stuff here. Yeah, it's 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 good to have them bringing out some more stuff because they definitely need some more stuff uh, to to span out the the fleets that you can have already. So it's good to see. Yeah. But anyways, into this little game that opens up like a movie case, right? Yeah, quite literally. Except we're talking about terrain today, so I know we are, but it's for that game. It is. So we are talking about some terrain for Don't Look Back. Uh, there is some new mini there's some new terrain that they've released. To start with, we have the Nobody Cannon, we have the Goatman Bridge, and we have the Altar of Summerton. I'm gonna start with the Nobody Cannon. Which is Cabin. Isn't that what I said? Cabin. Uh, I was hearing cannon. Okay, you need to get your ears checked. <laughs> Apparently. 
So the Nobody Cannon... Uh, no, I did say it. Now you've got me saying it. <laughs> the Nobody Cabin is um, definitely not a groovy cabin from a movie where the undead rise and it, it might be an army of, of, of darkness, perhaps. Um, Evil Dead, it's definitely not that. And it definitely doesn't come with a mini that looks like Ash. Um, I really like this cabin, honestly. Um, the way they design their terrain, based off how their game is designed, their terrain is stunning, in my opinion. Agreed. Because it's it's more than just something you sit on the table. It's a terrain you can interact with inside of it, not just around, around it. it. Yeah. And by the look of it, those windows and doors might actually be working. Maybe? No, that front door does not actually come to think of it. Uh, I think they're working I, doors. That's the, really the hard to tell. The shutters look like it. I mean, it looks like there's a pinhole for, yeah. for where the, the door and the window shutters are able to, to swing around in. It definitely does look like it. It's hard to tell, though. Yeah. Um, coming up next, honestly, is my favorite of the three. I love this. It's really simple, but I really like this set. So this Goatman Bridge, um, this one does not come with a free STL file, uh, but that's fine uh, because it's also smaller and a lot cheaper. So some say that Goatman Bridge is a haunted place. Um, I really, really, really like this. Um, like they actually say that this could fit for a few things, and I do have to agree with them because, yes, obviously it works for Don't Look Back, uh, but it... It, this is something that you could very easily come across in modern day. Uh, like they mentioned that it could be used for modern dead or spectre operations, um, which are different games that they don't make. Um, but this is kind of a... I would even say that you could probably throw this into a fantasy game, depending on the game. Maybe not Age of Sigmar, but... Mm -hmm. there, there was... Just get away with that, Sigmar. I mean, it's a, it's a covered wooden bridge. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I mean... It makes me think of the old Fable game from Xbox back in the day because there was definitely one of these in the town at one point. I don't remember if it was the first one or the second one, but it was definitely there. Um, that's my favourite of the three. All of this stuff is pre-painted, just in case you're not overly familiar with Black Sight Studios. I don't know what this last one is from, movie-wise. I know that this is from a movie. I just don't know which one. Um, and the mini that it comes with doesn't help me. Um, so this is the altar of Summerton. Um, and obviously again, this has been designed for Don't Look Back, and they mentioned the other ones as well. Um, everything comes pre-painted, same as before. So it comes with the very triangular building, which is just weird, but it's friend. supposed to be weird. Uh, and it also comes. See, the side comes off. It comes with the altar because this is some weird cult-type building. Uh, and it comes with... The, they're literally calling him Hammer Guy. This is going to be based on something. I just don't know what it's based on because it's clearly yeah. something I haven't seen. Mm -hmm. um, really nice-looking stuff. And I like the fact that they're doing stuff that's left of center. Uh, rather than just like, how many cabins can you have, and uh, they actually doing stuff that, because I mean everybody does city buildings, and uh, they do too, but doing stuff like this, if you have different things, uh, it'll potentially mean that they will look at your different building over somebody else's that is the same building everybody else made. That, that's what I like about things like this. That's just me. Do you guys have any preferences between the three? Uh, obviously, the the first cabin because you know. Yeah, I like the cabin too. It would I mean, be fun to play it, out Evil Dead. I don't know if this would be the game that I'd use for it because this is more designed for an, like an over, an overbearing killer. As opposed to because Evil Dead is more like multitudes uh, of stuff. Hello, Evil Ash. Actually, that's a point. 
Yeah, actually, that's a good point. It's not on the top of my head. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on again. So a Kickstarter. Printable scenery we've talked about a couple of times. They have scenery that you can print on a 3D printer. Wow, it's almost like their name is printed. That is done that way on purpose. So this particular one is all medieval towns. Um, so this is, again, something that you could very easily fit in, um, like fantasy or historicals or whatever you want. Uh, it is designed partially with D&D in mind as well. Um, mm -hmm. because that's where their original base is from. Um, I'm not sure you'd get as much use out of this in D&D. Um, depends on how you want to play it. I mean, some people like to have the full town and to build it up, but personally, if I'm just going through a town, we tend to just roleplay it and we tend to save mini stuff for, um, combat. I really like this stuff, though. This looks really cool. Uh, the roofs See in particular really jump out at me. So, so this kind of like you know where you, you pledge a X amount and you get the entire kit for the the entire you know village or whatever. This is the kind of thing where it's just like you know a, a turban organizer or you know a store where it's like yeah I'll pump this down you know I'll print it out and then I have like a full table set for you know my store my tournament whatever yeah. yeah. Um. Or if you're one of those guys where you have a massive room and the shelf space to it where you can print all the stuff out and you have a specific theme set for, you know, whatever game you're doing, whether it is a D&D &D or a Age of Sigmar or the list goes on. Yeah. I mean, some people have those rooms. I don't. The terrain that I have built at the moment is already a problem. And, and most of my stuff is not built yet. I need more shelf space. Um... This is uh, this is absolutely phenomenal. So you're looking at this is New Zealand dollars, so it is going to be less for you guys. But it's not. 90... Uh, I think it was like fifty bucks. Yeah. For yeah. so you've got the country pledge and you've got the king pledge. The king pledge is the, your 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 bigger buildings, obviously. Uh, and if you go through the um the stretch unlocks, it actually says what they come from. So there's ruined barns and so forth, and there's ruined kings this and ruined kings that. Um, and they, they tend to do this quite a lot in the cave one that we'd looked at previously. There was like goblin village stuff. No, it was like there was stuff for over the top and then there was goblin stuff for underneath the ground. Um, so they've done the same thing here. If you look through, you do actually get pictures of both. So you've got this little village and that's obviously the country pledge. And then you've got the big castle and that is very clearly the king pledge. It, it's fairly straightforward. Um, or you can buy both for 150 which again is New Zealand dollars, so it's a much less for both you and me. I think they've done and it looks like, And it looks like if you scroll the way down, you can add on previous yeah, sets they that, they, that they've designed. So. I really like that they've done some of the buildings in a ruined aspect, because then you could walk into like a ruined town that's got decimated by a dragon years ago, and then all of a sudden you're Still wandering through it. Or if you're playing a, a game and a building gets destroyed, you can actually yeah, replicate it on the table. Because most of yeah. these ruins are ruined versions of buildings that they have. Yeah. And you don't see that very often. No. Um, I mean, there are certain companies that do it, but no, it's not there something are. that you see a lot. Knights of Dice have done a little bit of that. Um, hi, Viv. If you ever come across this. I... like. This stuff is just beautiful. Honestly, it really is. Um, George mentioned earlier about the um, previous Kickstarters. You get a preview down the bottom. So there's a whole thing about halflings. I mean, we haven't spoken about halflings for, it feels like years Ten now. Ten minutes. <laughs> Ten minutes. Um, there's also furnishings. There's wizard stuff. Uh, wastes. So th there's a lot of Ship. different stuff there, and it tends the to ships. be. Actually, the ships are amazing. There's a there's an undead ship that I really like the look of. I don't think they picture it there though. Um, alternatively, you can buy the stuff separately through their website. But if you buy it through the website, you do tend to get it at a higher price. 
So if you can, if you do want to get the older stuff, you are better off buying it through the Kickstarter because you do get a little bit of a discount. All right, moving on from one dice tower to another, and I think this might be the cooler one because this uh, one yeah, I, is a drinking yeah. horn. Yeah, I, I saw this pop up, and I was just like, "Well, that's cool." So, this is yeah, the most is unique the- dice tower I have ever seen. The only it, thing it I will say the- is the inside of this appears to be smooth, and that's not going to help your dice be random. It's the only negative well, I've got. You, if you look at it, it curves and turns as it goes down. Yeah, but your dice could still, and probably will, just hit that and then slide. That's true. But, yeah, but that's I think it's... That's not why it's here. It's here to look cool. Uh, what it, it's, it's a mead horn that is mounted so you dump your dice in the top and they come out the bottom. That's literally it. It's an STL file you buy. Um, I didn't even look. Uh, it's five euro. Yeah. So five bucks for the file. Hypothetically, um, if you wanted to add a few things to this to help make the dice actually roll, because you print it in sections, you could probably just glue some things on the inside to help force the dice to roll. Like sprue chunks? Sprue chunks, um, wedges, like just stuff to block them. You wouldn't want too many because your dice will get stuck in it. But yeah. something but so that it can then hit, hit and it. bounce. And I'd be putting it towards the top, not at the bottom, because if you put them towards the bottom, then you're going to get the issue of things um, getting blocked. Getting stuck. Yeah. I really, so, really like this. This is so, so fun. Oh, so with that, for, I stay for 50 euro. You could upgrade it. Uh, well, Never for 50 upgrade euro, further you- down. You can spend a uh, uh, fifty euro and get a commercial license and print and sell. That'd be on, that that'd be worth it, honestly. So, but yeah, I was I was just cru- and like I'm a fan of dice towers just because you know it's 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 a fun little thing. Like you know it it it, t- it makes it even a little more random for rolling dice. And I saw this, and I was like, that's just so cool. Yeah, I, I really really like this. I mean, dice towers are something that everybody needs, and as much as a lot of dice towers kind of all look the same and kind of boring, it's one of the reasons why I like the terrain one. This is not a terrain one, obviously, uh, but this is just so different. Uh, don't well, it looks, don't it looks, actually drink out of this. Just, yeah, no, it's, it won't hold beverages. Um, well, I, you could print it to where it could, though. No, because it won't be food safe. Who cares about that? Do you think they cared about that 100 years ago? They weren't printing stuff out of resin a hundred years ago. Yeah, but the Romans were eating lead because it tasted sweet, so... The Romans were stupid. Hey, their rows are still in better shape than mine. That's fair. It's not, their fault. It's not their fault you live in nowhere. So... You're like, uh, you, can't but ex- this is... you can't expect the government to fix roads in a state that doesn't exist. Yeah. Come on. But, so, I mean, but this is the kind of thing where it's like, you know... You know, your friends that, you know, play games, you know, print this out. Christmas gift, birthday gift, whatever. Yeah. I know you mentioned the license price earlier, but I don't think we've actually mentioned this tower is only five euro. No, I said that. Yeah, it was. it's Did only you? five euro for the. Oh, right. Yeah. And th- this is Wait, just, uh, it's such good value, this. I mean, it's just one item. Yes, but this is just so much fun. Also, I have to point this out. Did you see what his pledge goal was? Yeah, ten bucks. <laughs> yeah, I just need a tenner. A, a, a lot of people do. A lot of people do that though, and they, the idea because people will back so. it when they see that it's over the line. So you, they take the risk on that, hoping to make sure that it does actually get over. Yeah, most of the work yeah, will already be done on this though. I was gonna say, like, if he doesn't have this file ready to go, I mean, <laughs> well, you can see the file ready to go. Exactly. The only, the only so. question would be would be the supports. Um, because obviously everything in this is going to need to be supported when you print it. So, uh, I don't know if it actually is pre-supported or not. Hopefully, it is. Hmm. Doesn't say. All right, moving on from one three D printing company to another, but this one's not on Kickstarter. I want to look at three D Alien Worlds again because their stuff is so pretty. We have looked at these guys before. 
Uh, we touched on a couple of their sets previously, and we kind of did these guys for an indie at some stage. Um, the Samurai Shrine set is the newest thing that they've done. And as far as value is concerned, uh, it's not actually available yet. But the set comes with, like, this is almost a Bushido table just by itself. You're getting all of these lanterns, all of these roads. Like, it, it just works so nicely. Um, I kind of want it just for the roads themselves, honestly, because they're just so pretty. The temple itself is quite big. The temple itself is, well, sorry, the shrine itself is arguably a little bit too big for a samurai, t uh, for a Bushido table, but it's not made specifically for Bushido. It's just Japanese themed terrain. Um, Where's Bushido? Two by two? Two by two. So this, this building would be a little bit too big, which is fine because that would take up most of a two by two by itself. Yeah. But if you just grab all the little streets and the fences and the little smaller shrines, that would work perfect. Yeah. The lanterns. I, this stuff. I, is I would even. I would. I would even argue like taking that building and putting it on the back edge of one of the four sides of the board. Mm. I think that would. I would think that would create a very interesting, unique table instead of just plopping it down the middle. The only thing I will say is that they haven't shown us a picture of the inside. I assume, because it's not really that exciting on the inside. Um, because the other option would be is if you put it dead center, then you're trying to get inside the building. And it kind of creates a little bottleneck, especially if you've got, if you're playing uh, totems or something, and one of the totems is on the inside, and that's the one that's worth the most points. Uh, then you're forcing a bit of a bottleneck to try and get to it, which might be interesting for the game. Uh, it just depends on what that f that final actual size is. Um, as weird as it is, I think my favourite part of this is actually the roads, and it's such a boring thing to really like. But they're so unique. Like the tile road type idea. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. this is the thing that's existed for a long time, but... I don't know anybody else that's made this. I mean, maybe they have, but I, I just don't know of anybody else that has. This stuff is just so pretty. As weird as the sounds, I'm kind of a fan of the tree stump. Yeah, the tree stump's nice. Yeah. I'll agree with you on that. Wh what kind of piece of terrain is that? How many people are like, let's just have a tree stump? Yeah. It's either the tree or nothing. You know, like... It's it's a line of sight, but it looks like it's something that you could very easily get up and stand upon. Oh, the jade dragons are nice. So the the jade lions are nice too. I didn't even see those. Yeah, no, I, I'm a big fan of this. It it looks really nice. Uh, also from 3D Alien Worlds, we have a dice tower because it seems to be the theme of the episode. Uh, I was gonna say. We we've talked about more dice towers in this uh, this episode than we have this entire year so far. Um, this is easily my favorite of all of them. Um, all of this stuff is three D printed, but this legitimately looks like something that you would find. Like this looks like uh, the the one from Sarissa Precision is nice. It's not this nice. It's not even close. Um, so. My my argument with this one is the roofs. I think they're way too over exaggerated as far as like how far out from the the center of the building they are. I th I think they need to be h half of what they are for it to look appropriate. But it still looks really cool. I'm, I'm yeah, no, yeah, I agree. They look a little big. I don't know. I mean, it gave me the I, I can't remember what the movie is, but there was a movie that was being filmed while Bruce Lee passed away. And the building looked very similar to this. It may not quite be as wide as this, but it, that's what it reminds me of anyway. Uh, obviously, yeah, you, you take the roof off, and that's where your dice tower comes into it, and then it rolls out into the field below. Oh, I really, really like this. <laughs> Apparently, I'm by myself on this, but I really like this. See, so, so take this, 
put that in the center, replace, uh, use the other set with the roses and stuff like that, and then I think you have a better, a better terrain. Flip a shader, setup. yeah. Um, especially Although when th this you include... may still be too big for Bushido. If if you take away the fence portion and just the square base, yeah, th that's this like one, what this one definitely does not end up in the center of the table like the other one does for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um I don't know. It'd be but interesting just... to see. I I'd say the base of that is six by six inches, maybe even eight by eight at the most. Not counting the 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 fences. garden, yeah, which the, is, the fences, which is a quarter of your table. If it's a two by two, yeah, a six by six. That's so. So the, setting this up with the fence, and yes, I know that you said that you would take the fence away. Um, so there's literally a quarter of your table gone. Because it goes from the very edge of deployment to the very center point of the table. Because if you look, the fence is the same size as the base of the tower. Sure, but, the, but it's, it's it's taking up less space than that other building, though. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. So that's that, that's that's what my point and takeaway was that this this would fit better than the other building. Mm. Um, but then you also pair uh, the the third link you've got here, which market souls. Yeah. For the um, record, like, because I'm just giving feedback from a Bushido perspective, because that's what I play. This is not designed specifically for Bushido. It works insanely well for Bushido for obvious reasons, but it's not what it's specifically designed for. This is designed as samurai terrain for any number of different games. I just want to clarify that because people may get the impression that the guy's designing stuff that doesn't work for a game. When it's not what he specifically looks for, looks at. Uh, yes, market stalls. Market stalls is is a game setting that works very well, mm -hmm. um, and it would work very well for Bushido because why not? Why does everything always have to be in some random village with no people in it? Why can't a battle happen in the middle of an actual, real place? Well, not real, but you know what I mean. More uh, an urban setting, yeah. Um, and all of these market stores, like they all look different. They're all holding different things. I like the fact that you're getting minis that look like they belong in the middle of the table. Whether you would use them for a game is another question. But if you were actually playing a, a more generic setting, or if you were role playing in feudal Japan. Um, then you literally have a table here ready to go to role play out whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing. Uh -huh. I was going to say, yeah, because, I mean, you can put enough spacing where you can move in between, but line of sight is just broken up, and yeah, yep. it's... There's a nice shot at the end of um of all of them. So there's, what, 10 different market stalls, which feels about right. Um, There's some of them that are bigger than the others. Which again, yeah, feels ten. right. The fish stall is the big one by the look of it. Well, it's probably one of the most important parts of the, the, the village. Yeah. Food. Real deal. <laughs> toys and kites. You need to paint up the toys to look like Bushido models. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really like this stuff. On um, the fruit and veggie ones, the bigger one as well, which again makes sense. I, yeah, the, the, these look good. Yeah, no, they, they've they, they've really outdone themselves with this. So there we go. That's 3D Alien Wells. Not all of that has been released this week. Uh, some of this, I know the Dice Tower was there at least a few weeks ago, but it's not something that we'd covered. There is a couple of other new things there as well that I haven't covered. I will just quickly show off on camera. There is a sumo ring here, uh, which is quite fun. It's literally just a giant building. Like, this would work in the middle of a table very well. Um, I would probably rule it so that you you have full line of sight when you're in it, but maybe not from the outside. It's blocking terrain until you climb up those stairs, maybe. 
Uh, it might make for an interesting game. Uh, but otherwise, and I like the Simu models too. Something that I could see wor see working for a game. But otherwise, shall we discuss an indie? Indie. Definition. Independent. Type. Slang word. Jargon. Boy, oh boy, do I like this. <laughs> You're a fan You're of... You're a fan of exploitation? Are you a, are you a fan of flags, are you? Well, so... Uh, Warlord Games... Is it Warlord? What's Warlord? Uh, yeah. Well, they do an American Civil War game. And I've always been tempted to get into it. And... Okay. You can get flags for that entire army, and you can get regimental flags for the different regiments. So, and, and, this week we are yeah. talking, and, and ironically, I came across this last night trying to find something. I was almost going to cover something entirely different. Um, so, Flags of War is a miniature company based in Europe. They have a whole heap of different things available. So, just looking at the miniatures... We have a whole heap of state things from the War of Austrian Succession. There's a whole heap of stuff from the Jacobite Rebellion, um, which we will look at. Street Wars New York City, which is where... Black exploitation. George, that, that, that's where George's comment's coming from. Border Wars. But the first one I want to click on is Funky Skull Miniatures. Because this is what got my attention. And I want you to open up Dueling Sea Dogs. Why has nobody done Popeye and all of that before? <laughs> I don't care about anything else. Everything else on this website is secondary to Popeye. This just works for me. Yeah, this is awesome. It is a really cool bolo too. Uh, the only one I would probably say olive oil looks a little bit weird. Like that yeah. face, that face on olive oil doesn't look. I mean, olive oil has a weird head anyway. Like in the cartoon, like she has a really weird looking head. But yeah, there's something off. Weird. There's something off about olive oil there. We also have some daring detectives and some teen adventurers. All of this stuff is very, very fun. So the, the Daring Detectives is definitely not Tintin. Definitely not Tintin. And that's definitely not, that's definitely not his dog that's right there next to him. Uh, you've got the two French guys. You've got the captain. Like this is, and you've got the professor. You've got a Tintin adventure waiting to happen. And Teen Adventurers. <laughs> teen Adventurers. It's so good. I don't recognize those at all. No, definitely not. It's definitely not from a very popular movie from the 80s. I mean, it's, it's a movie that clearly nobody saw, which is why we've been, have been screaming for a sequel ever since that we will never get. Josh Brolin's actually starting to push for it now, though, too. So he, he, I think he's got enough um, influence that now. Josh Brolin was until the writer part. Was it the writer or the director? Somebody passed away. Uh, mm. And as far as he was concerned, it didn't happen unless the whole team was there, um, because it it was too important. I I would love to have seen it because this is a particular franchise that I think really could have worked with a modern redo. Not not redo, but um, with a modern twist on the sequel, like they did with Ghost Ghostbusters Afterlife. I think it would have really worked for this. <sighs> All right. There's also a whole heap of medieval stuff, but so we're, we're so real quick, if, if you go to Street Wars, New York City, yeah, that's where I was going to go next. Miniatures. That, that's not the crow. Lee Raven. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even notice that. That's actually well spotted. I hadn't gotten that far down. Oh, I just closed it. I'm an idiot. That is so well done. I just found a better one. Yeah. Jake Lee Fu. 
Is that the guy from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? That would it be is. Casey Jones. I have a friend <laughs> that always used to joke that um, Jason Voorhees ripped off Casey Jones. Now, obviously, that doesn't work because Jason Voorhees is older, but that's, you know, kind of. D- d- does he also think that um, uh, Tolkien ripped off J.K. Rowling, too? He might have done. That would be after our time, though. Uh, I want to have a look at this funky dude because this looks like probably the <clears throat> biggest example of what you were talking about. Oh, it's an undead guy. Funky dude is a is somehow this guy was so funky that even in the afterlife he still has a has an afro. This might be my favorite skeleton of all time. Funky dude is literally a miniature of their logo, basically. So this is all very fun and very silly. Um, it's not all going to be for everyone. It's definitely going for a very specific. Uh, flair with this. Um, Go to M13 Stanley and tell me who that is. M13 Stanley? Okay. Or what he's looking for. Oh, it's um, Clockwork Orange. Yeah. Yeah, that works. Actually, that's a really nice, well done mini, too. It looks just like the actor. Well, the the second head option looks just like the actor. The second one doesn't. I mean, the first one doesn't. Um, I, I I really like this stuff. I mean, look, it's not like most of this is very very silly, uh, and that's fine. Um, and yes, obviously, black exploitation is part of what they're going for on this. I kind of get the impression because it feels like it's more taking the piss, um, to me. Um, more than like it's 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 leaning into that the same way that minis lean into the eighties stuff and the silliness of it. That's the impression I well, get just from looking at it. Yeah, the, well, it's 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 based off black exploitation, which you know, Undercover Brother. That was wholly hilarious. That was Undercover the Brother whole thing. is amazing. Yeah, uh, if you go to Black Cobra's Gang, that is the the pinnacle of what I was talking about, though. Yeah, yeah. This is literally the it, it's. It's people from um, uh, the Bruce Lee movie. Enter the Dragon? No. Yeah, Enter the Dragon. Mm-hmm. One of these literally looks like the guy from Enter the Dragon. Yeah, this uh, so, it's so, a lot of fun. You, you want to talk about Great Skulls? Yes. Go to the Devil Outcast Gang. Oh, nice. That works. You see the dude with the baseball bat? Yeah. That looks really nice. Now you need to blur that. No. <laughs> okay, I don't see why I would be blurring anything. It's a rude gesture. Oh yeah. I was thinking <laughs> so- oh, I was thinking something else. All right. Let's check out I want to look at the Jacobite Rebellion. Uh, and let's... I'm just going to go to 1945... Sorry, 1745 deals, just because I don't want to look at everything. I just want to kind of look at a few things. So let's have a look at the Jacobite Highlanders muskets. This is a very, very... Oh, there's no picture. Okay, never mind. We don't care about this now. There's Lowlander muskets. Let's go to Jacobites. Oh, wait, no, there isn't. Okay, miniatures, Jacobite Rebellion, and then go to Jacobites, and then we get some actual minis. So the Jacobite Rebellion is not something I know very much of. I know it's a very big thing in history that people wanted to play and couldn't, uh, but it's just it's not something I'm really overly familiar with myself. So I don't do minis- I don't do historical gaming. Um... This definitely doesn't feel as silly as the other stuff we were looking at. So not everything is silly and over the top. Like some of the stuff is just just minis. Uh, the Royal Ecosia's standing firing minis are really nice.
Looks like everything is metal as well. Um, what's what's on Border Wars? Nothing is on Border Wars. Well, that's exciting. Um, uh, the socks. You had noticed something for Civil War. Yeah, so go under the eighteen hundred, and then American Civil War, and you can get flags for. Oh, oh there it is. The Confederate, the, the Army, Union Army, the Cavalry, Union Div- Division Corps. I mean, it's it's kind of cool. Uh, the one I was looking at in particular was I've been to the battlefield Gettysburg, which is up in up, uh, Pennsylvania, and so uh, I was just looking to see if some of the flags from the. the the regiments that fought there were there, and lo and behold, 20th Maine is there, and I've actually been on the spot where they were standing and then charged down the hill, so... That, that's it's funny you mention that, because they also have uh, the U.S. Uh, 7th Cav Custer's personal yep. guide on, which... Yeah, I saw that, too. I've been to where he died, so... I'm gonna take all of your words on all of this. <laughs> um, is- flags are something that kind of like you would expect to see more of sometimes than you do. Um, so it's nice when you do get companies out there doing it. I mean, is, is it hard to do this stuff? I mean, no, you could probably set it out in a Word document properly eventually, but buying a set of these is a lot easier. Especially yeah, I was going to say, you know. It's IT based. Well, get yourself a, a set of uh, uh, mailing labelers. You know, find an image, print a label, cut it out, stick it on. I mean, it's better than me acting like a uh, un, un, untalented two-year-old drawing a flag. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, flags of war has a lot of have a lot of interesting things. Uh, not all of it is going to be for everyone. Uh, I mean, the the very silly stuff that we were looking at originally is very much going to be for a very specific part of the. Of the world, and there is a lot of stuff on here that we haven't looked at. Obviously, uh, I mean, there's stuff from Napoleonics. Um, like we you can get Nazi flags. You could, if you wanted to. Uh, there's stuff from the the Chinese Civil War. There's lots and lots of stuff that we have not looked at, including a whole fantasy range that I'm going to open and look at very briefly. Um, and now that we've looked at it, we can move on to hobby. Dream, blue, prime, paint. What have you been up to, Socks? <clears throat> Not a whole lot. To be Unex- unacceptable. I know. Um, we we took a break from school, so we were doing some stuff around this, with uh, just going to see some sites, and then we started school back up with the. The kids, and so trying to get them back in the swing of things. So that's that's been my scheduling in the evenings. So we homeschool our kids, so uh, we took a little bit of a break so they could have somewhat of a summer break because they didn't really have much of one. Because uh, j- just because when we have family in town, that's kind of their breaks, and and so we extended their their schooling into the summer a little bit because we had so much family coming and visiting us over the last year. Yeah, uh, that we've been here, so uh, we kind of took a little bit. A little bit of a break, so now they're back in it. So cool. I've been trying to help them. So and the wife. So George, that's, that's been it. But I hope to get some painting done here soon. George, I, I I punched cardboard tokens out. That's exciting. What for? Uh, massive darkness too. Ah, nice. Um, there are so many tokens in that game. It's a Simon game. I'm not surprised. Well, and since like, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, oh, ten, yeah, good one. point. Yeah, I've got oh, thirteen I'm gonna boxes. Have he- I'm gonna have that for He Man too. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, we should do a live stream of that, Bruce. Of me, <laughs> of me poking out tokens. No, we could do it together. It'll be so exciting for people to watch. Don't worry. Have you seen some of stuff? I feel the same way when I open up a box or a board game from Fantasy Flight because they have they are also lots of tokens. Games. Yeah, Fantasy Flight's a pretty big one on that too. Um, no, but I have been doing some sketching and planning 
uh, on building my shelf to hold all of this when I pull everything out in two weeks to redo the floor and then start actually like putting the stuff back together. I've been doing sketching and stuff recently as well, without saying like too much because it's a Patreon exclusive thing. Have you guys actually been looking at the stuff that I've been doing? Yeah, your sketching is not too terrible from no. from what you said. There, I, there, I there's not, that. I am not an know. artist, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so on a recommendation though, have you tried any of those uh, AI drawing uh, websites? No, um, I have been tempted to look at them though. Uh, the only reason I haven't is I don't know IP wise because if my project actually ends up going ahead, I would like things to be mine uh, rather than stuff. Well, that's I, questionable. I, 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 I'm just suggesting it's like placeholders in the time being to to True. to where you you can you know say make it this but not this. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I've been spending a lot of time on that. There's been a couple of um, logos that I've designed recently, which maybe I can look up. Hang on. Uh, I'm going to interject real quick because I'm still looking at uh, the indie. The fantasy flags, a lot of those are from a uh, well-known book series that the TV show got finished before the book series got finished, and now is there are it, prequels coming out. Is it something that's based on a war around flowers? Uh, no, uh, a chair made out of swords. Yes, but the book series is loosely based on the War of the Roses. Very loosely. Um, I want... Okay, anyway, yeah, I was going to bring up the logos, but I can't without screwing up the recording. So, um, yeah, I've been working a little bit on my secret project. Uh, it's again coming very very close. I actually have the turning templates done now. A friend actually did those for me um, Because the issue I was having is Okay, so if you have movement templates that need accurate inches, it's not overly difficult, right? Because you just use a ruler Essentially, yeah, except yep. except if you need that to be on a specific curve because if you yeah. use a computer and you stretch something into a curve, it doesn't do this. It stretches. So then you would have to remeasure everything every time you move everything. So he managed to get it, and it should be extremely close, like to the point where it's close enough that it shouldn't make a big difference now. And I have all three of my movement templates. So in theory, I can test certain parts of the game now. Oh, yeah, it's a game that, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, otherwise, I have been building my Ecto-1, the Lego set that I purchased a little while ago. I'm about a third of the way through now, maybe half of the way through. Um, it's it, it actually looks like something now. Does it look like Lego? I mean, it does, but it also looks like Ecto-1 from Ghostbusters. Made a Lego. Well, yes, it is a Lego kit. <laughs> <laughs> if it didn't look like Lego, I'd be a little bit concerned, I suppose. Um, I actually got a game of something in. I have played things. Ooh. I played Bushido Friday night. Oh. Nice. So I recently have been painting up a whole heap of stuff for my testing of the army painter stuff. And it's a new faction that I've been painting as part of my testing. So I bought a whole heap of Bakimono, which I don't mind actually revealing now because I was kind of not talking about what it was there for a little bit. So the Bakimono were the little gremlin looking dudes, little goblin looking dudes. Oh, nice. Uh, I've been painting my guys up, trying to make them look like they're... Because, I mean, I didn't want to do green because everybody always does green. Um, and I, I kind of picked a sandy color thinking that it would just look like it's not natural. And I didn't want the skin to like look like a natural skin tone. It's kind of come out looking Middle Eastern, which is disappointing. Um, but I, I don't mind the way they look, honestly. Um, I just hope that people don't look at it and get, think that, that was a deliberate design choice because it definitely was not. Um, I 
had considered stripping them a second time and painting them like really bright blue or bright red or something because I thought maybe making them imps might be fun. But I'm just going to keep keep on doing what I'm doing for the moment. Um, game went fairly well. Um, I was playing with these guys for the first time, so I definitely made a lot of mistakes. The first two rounds, genuinely, it looked like I was going to slaughter the guy. Uh, and then everything went wrong. And everything just fell apart, and I lost really badly. Is that why you started rolling dice? No, dice didn't really play a huge factor in this. See, the Bakimono are very much like they're a horde faction. They're very, very weak. Uh, but you have a lot of them. And I had seven people to his four. But his four are all very much very elite. Um, so the moment he started killing things, he just killed them. Um, and I kind of made the mistake of, like, because these guys can all pull their their key together. Key is what you use to get off certain abilities. And because I had all of this key, I just used all of it. And then I didn't have enough to really take advantage of it when I needed it, as opposed to doing it when I didn't need it. Yeah. Uh, and I was probably protecting the wrong people at certain points too. Uh, I, I spent a whole heap of key trying to boost the abilities of the weaker guys, which was just pointless because they're the weaker guys. I don't care about them. Um, but yeah, that that's... That, I really enjoyed the game, honestly. Um, it's been a while since I've played Bushido because there's only a couple of us playing it at the moment. The other guys that were playing it are kind of lost in bot war, um, which is fine. I mean, I like bot war as well, um, but I've been kind of really itching at the bit to get a game of Bushido in. Next week, I'm going to be getting my first game of Moonstone in. So I'm Thanks. excited for that as well. Okay. Talk nerdy to me. All right. Back into Drop Zone Commander this time. And we are looking at the Resistance he Heavies. Because it's the Resistance's turn. So in Drop Zone, uh, we don't have this issue, this issue of one ship being for um, everything. So there is actually some stuff to well, talk got, about got here. Ships. We've got um, three things to discuss. We've got a Hannibal tank. Our vehicles. We've got a Napoleon tank. Um, and we have the Thunderstorm Heavy Hovercraft, which I already know is very popular. <laughs> the Hovercraft is very popular. People complain about the fact that it's not in stock all the time. Um, Socks, you want to go for the Hannibal? Yep, so I'll go for the Hannibal. It's uh, 40 points a piece. Your squad size is 2 to 4 as a transport capacity uh, or transport requirement, I should say, not capacity, transport requirement of 3. So you, uh, just make note of that when you're building your list. Uh, its move is 3. Its countermeasure is active. Armor 15, damage 2. It's a tank, no special rules. It has a 120 millimeter Punisher cannon, which uh, has uh, it can move and fire. It's full value. Front and side, rear, uh, range full is infinite. Range countered is 18 inches. It has one shot, two act, two plus accuracy. Energy is 10, and then it has a 90 millimeter cannon. Again, it has a full range of move and fire. It's front arc only. Range full is infinite. Range countered is also 18 inches. One shot, two plus accuracy, nine energy on that one. And then you have a machine gun. Uh, again, no moving fire penalties. Front side, rear, 24 inch full, 12 inch countered, three shots, three plus accuracy, four energy. And then you can replace the 120 millimeter Punisher cannon with a high X hammer cannon for 10 points. And the high X hammer cannon is no penalty for moving fire. Uh, front side, rear, 12 inches countered and 12 inches full. Uh, one shot, uh, two plus accuracy, 11 energy, and has the Devastator 4 for scenery. So if you want to destroy some scenery, take the high X uh, hammer cannon. But if you want to try and deal some damage to some tanks, I stick with the 120 millimeter. Um, Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's another one of these that, that have a lot of options. Well, not a lot, but it, ha it has the options to do pretty much anything you want. Um, yeah. It doesn't have Baba Beans with a nice Chianti, though. No, doesn't. True. But with it, 15 it, it armor, fails. that's. Yeah, with having 15 armor and two damage points, it's one of the heaviest uh, units in the game in terms of armor with multiple hit points. 
Given that it's uh, only forty show. points too, I mean, this is pretty good value. I was I was gonna say, look at that uh the hundred and twenty mil cannon and the ninety mil cannon. Uh forty point model, those seem like really good weapons. Yeah. Uh squad size is two to four. So you're looking at forty you're looking at eighty points minimum. 160 if you want to bring two or two full. Uh, I mean, I kind of like the idea of bringing a full squad of them and having one of the hammer cannons just so that you've got that option. Because you've still got the 90 mil cannon on it. Yeah. Hmm. All right, moving on. George, would you like to cover Mr. Napoleon? Yes. Uh, The Napoleon heavy tank, unlike his uh, namesake. It's 120 points. He is obviously, uh, uh, you know, big there because he's got a move of two inches, uh, countermeasures are active, armor of 15, damage of five. He is a tank. Um, Banisher, rotary cannon, mood and fire, no penalty. Arc is front and side. Rage is 36, full, counter is 18. Uh, eight shots, armor or uh, accuracy of three plus with energy of six, cover, soft body, focus, minus two. Um, then you have... He's got the, two of those. Yeah, it's got two of those. Same stats. So, um, that's a lot of shots. Yeah. Then you have, uh, Chain Gun. There's two of those. Um, oh, is that a, a dash two instead of minus two? Dash two, sorry. Dash two, not minus two. Um... Yes, yeah. Yep. Ch- chain Gun, uh, Moving Fire, no penalty. Arc is front and side. Uh, range is 36, uh, countered is 18, shots 4, uh, 3 up to hit, and energy 6, uh, and it has focus of 2. Um, this tank has a lot of shots. This tank is slow, and this tank is expensive. Well, all, all And you only get one for slow. one point. Yeah, yeah, you get one tank for 120 points. Yeah, as opposed to the previous option where you would have had four of them for that. But this is, right. I mean, this is a very powerful weapon. Uh, there is a little note down there on the bottom that when you're using focus, oh. uh, no individual hit is allowed to go above energy 10. So you're going to be limited on what this can do. On your banisher rotary cannon. Yes. So, so on the bigger of the, of the two cannons. So that, that's only if you're using your focus option. Correct. So you get your focus, but your focus is going to cost you a little. Probably, I, I think this might be the better looking out of all of. I, I think the I actually prefer this over the. I love the hover. Don't get me wrong; it looks cool, but I think this might be my favorite aesthetically. Uh, yeah, it, it it definitely has the coolest look for sure. It's so the, unique. Uh, the quad- I've not really seen anything else that looks like that tank wise. Yeah, and and this one is a very. So yeah, you have the focus fire that you can use, but this one is going to be clearly. To do, to get infantry out of buildings, yeah, um, with the 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 ability to go through both soft and body cover on your banister cannon, um, just just sit there and tear infantry apart. Yep. Go for it. That's what it's going to be for. All right. Um, Last but not least, we have the thunderstorm heavy hovercraft. So this is two hundred points. So this is even more again. Uh, squad size of one. Takes up 12 slots, so this thing is just, like, yeah, it's just, yeah. Moves 10 inches, though, so you don't necessarily need it to be taken across. Uh, Active countermeasures, E plus 1. Armor of 13, damage of 9. It's a skimmer, because it's a hovercraft. Uh, It has also is a command center, and it's large. So, this thing has four looted plasma cannons. All of them have a move and fire of six inches. They're front, side, and rear. The range full is 18 inches. Counted as 18 inches. It's got one shot. Accuracy of 2 plus. Energy 12. And the special is Devastator 2 Infantry and Scenery. Uh, Hovercraft. When a unit disembarks from this unit, measure from any spot on its edge rather than the center. Uh, A disembarking unit suffers only a plus one penalty to its accuracy instead of plus two uh, and can target aircraft in the same round. Additionally, this unit does not have to start the game in reserve, ignoring 
the aerial advantage rule. So, because the hovercraft is designed in this way, you can kind of just jump over the side, I guess, is the way that yep. they're talking about it there. Also, they have the ability to kind of turn instantly on their axis, so it's making allowance for the way that a hovercraft actually works. So this actually performs a couple of different duties. I mean, this can work, this can move 10 inches, but this can actually take stuff with it as well, which is interesting. Yep. So you can bring like six flame wagons, for example, or two, uh, six storm wagons, storm artillery wagons. And I've actually played against one of these a uh, long time ago in the tournament that I played in while I was still in England. And it was nasty. I mean... I mean, this thing is six about six inches square. So just think of this thing. I mean, this this model is huge. Yeah. And then just rolling up there, shooting the plasma weapons, and then unloading good number of vehicles right into your face at the same time. And so it's yeah, um, it's kind of nasty. So yeah, but you've got flame wagons, very attack ATVs, free riders, storm artilleries, the remote bomb buses. There's there's quite a few options of what can go inside of this. Yeah. Uh, the Columbus Battle Walker could go inside of this. You'd only get two of them, but you could get it inside. So you, you do have a lot of options there. Um, I quite like this. Um, because it's, it's, a, it's a carrier that actually does more than just carry. I... I can't sit here and say that any of them are bad, honestly. And I see, I feel like I say that every time we look at drop zone. Uh, I think the Napoleon heavy tank takes it for me, but that ha that the Hannibal is much better value than I was expecting it to be. Um, given that it's kind of a one trait, right? that actually can do. You take four of those, you're gonna do quite well. Uh, my math was slightly out on what I said earlier, though. It was 160 to take all four. So you'd only get three of them for the 120. But still, three, three of them, that's six damage total across the unit. And, and so that's three different targets that they're having to kill instead of just one. So I so a have a feeling that taking more than one Napoleon might be nice too. So my issue is if you're going to dump the kind of money, or money, well, money, yeah, uh, oh. points, <laughs> um, Put, get yourself the uh, the thunderstorm heavy hovercraft, transport some stuff, get a couple of Hannibals, and then get the Alexander heavy tank as your uh, command vehicle. Yeah, instead instead of the using a Napoleon. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Because you know that that Alexander, it's your command vehicle. It can do some of the heavy lifting that the the other the Napoleon can, but it's got a really big gun with the chain guns. It's yep. fewer points. Yeah, that's no, that's a good option. Yeah, the thing I like about the Napoleon is what Sox was saying, where it could it could just tear through the buildings and get things out. Yeah, of it. that that's the benefit there because the Hannibal can't do that. Um. And and what what's the primary objective in drop zone? Going in to buildings with infantry and getting the objectives out. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, I think the best option out of those though is, is that thunderstorm, just because it's got teeth and it can carry other stuff that has teeth as well. Yeah, quite literally. And 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 based off what I remember of the game, ten inches is a pretty decent move factor it is, for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think what's six and eight was considered to be kind of long. And, yeah. and throwing out there, you know, something that's ten that can, you know, unload a bunch of other stuff. That's that's not that's, a, pretty... that's not an aircraft too, because your aircraft are, are usually eight, twelve inches, sixteen inches. But something on the ground, you're absolutely right. Ten inches across the ground, that's massive for a ground unit. Yeah. yeah. And then you're, and then you're able to dump stuff out on top of that on the same in the same activation. So the thing I like about drop zone. And I do kind of hint towards this a lot, uh, but I don't think I've outright said it since we did kind of that episode where it's like, this is the basics. There's not really a lot of things in this that are bad. Like everything has a place that it could be useful. Um, this is one of those games where 
thankfully and unfortunately, you kind of want to have everything because everything does potentially have a place. Um, so a lot of this stuff is not so much a matter of, I mean, is there going to be stuff that's more optimal? Yes, of course. Uh, but you're never going to take things and just look at them and go, well, this was pointless. I should never use this again. Uh, it's more going to be looking at stuff. Well, that didn't work for me today, but this is why. Um, so, yeah. I mean, if if you take the Napoleon and never really get the chance to use it in the buildings or against the buildings, obviously you'll be disappointed. But that won't make the Napoleon a bad a bad choice. It just means that it didn't work for you that game. So that's what I like about Drop Zone. That everything has a place that it can be useful. Maybe not next. Demos, demos, you know, that kind of stuff. All right. Upcoming events. Uh, we've got the same couple this time. Uh, Sox, do you have the date for your next meetup? So we are not doing one in September. Uh, I know that. Because he's going be to be out of town. Uh, so October time, I'm not sure. It's probably going to be just looking at the calendar on my computer real quick. It's probably going to be October 8th or 15th because it's usually the second or third week yep. of the month so my guess is 8th or the 15th will be cool. the next one uh pax west takes place in september from the second to the fifth uh pax australia takes place from october 7th till 9th so i won't be able to come to your event i'm sorry socks because i'll be at pax australia okay uh three-day passes are sold out the one-day passes are still going, but Saturday is 70% sold out at this point. Saturday is the biggest day of the event, so if you are wanting to go on the Saturday, you probably need to do something about it now uh, because you're only looking at probably another month before Saturday is sold out, I suspect. Uh, PAX Unplugged, December 2nd till 4th. Uh, and that's it as far as the upcoming events is concerned at this stage. Um, thank you, as always, to those that support us. We do appreciate it. Uh, thank you for those that have been giving feedback on my secret project. I do appreciate that as well. Um, if you enjoy our content, uh, if you would like to contribute towards feedback, if you have anything that you want to say at all, uh, you can reach out towards us at gettingtabled at gmail.com. You can support us at patreon.com slash gettingtabled. Uh, you get early access to practically everything that we do. Uh, including videos, there's behind-the-scenes stuff that you get access to. You get to talk to us on the Discord. We do have a Discord. The link is on your screen now. Uh, feel free to join that. You don't have to be a Patreon to join it. You just don't get access to the Patreon stuff without being a Patreon. Um, which at this stage is the knowledge of my secret game. or well, not knowledge, the, the, the access to the development progress on that. Uh, and the Patreon chat. We have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash getting tabled. That's where the video version of this podcast will be hosted. Um, as always, Patreon get access to the video edition on the day that it goes live. Everybody else gets it the following week. So there is a definitely a decent reason to follow there. Um, otherwise, Twitter and Instagram is at getting tabled. Website is getting tabled.weebly.com, which we need to update. And my Twitch, Twitch TV slash Jason the Bruce. Mondays and Thursdays, that schedule is likely to be changing sometime soon. Do the thing? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For listening to Getting Table. Music used in this podcast was created by Eric Mattias at soundimage.org.